So in our last class, um, it was really on the theme of intimacy and uh, Zen Master Dogen's very well-known teaching that to be enlightened, to be free, is to be intimate with all things. And, I, and I've always loved that word, intimacy, that sense of um, that to be intimate we really have to sense a belonging with whatever we're intimate with, a kind of a oneness, a deep familiarity, a tenderness. And so the inquiry uh, from the last class is really what awakens that kind of intimate connectedness. And we spoke about the single factor that makes it possible, which is our capacity to pay attention. If we can pay attention well, if we can pay attention fully, there is a quality of connectedness that emerges. And in the Buddhist tradition, there are four key domains where we train that attention. And these are domains, they're called the Brahma Viharas. Brahma is the king of all gods and Vihara is the dwelling place or our abode, the home. And so it really is like the home of God or the home of our own awakened heart-mind, these four places. And they are love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. So what I'd like to do for these next four weeks, probably four weeks, sometimes I'll start, I'll do one, I'll realize I need to do another week on it, but we'll see, is explore how these places of training our heart-mind um, can really arouse that intimate connectedness, how they allow us to be intimate with all of life. And we'll start with the first one, we'll start with uh, loving-kindness. And, but just to say that each of these qualities is an innate expression of who we are. We already, it's already our nature when we're, um, when we're relaxed, when we're open, when we're not in reactivity, there's a natural um, expression of love of compassion, of joy, of equanimity. I sometimes uh, think of Aldous Huxley because there's so many of his, what he wrote that became real teachings for me. But one of the greatest wasn't a writing, it's, an, it's what happened as he was dying. And he, he was dying of throat cancer and he, ha he was surrounded by uh, his family and, and some students, so, you know, people that were younger that really admired him. And one of them asked him uh, what he had learned, you know, what he had learned through his life. And he couldn't speak very loud, so he's kind of whispered the answer. But his response was, be a little kinder. I sometimes think if that was it, if that was our whole spiritual path, if just moment by moment something in us said, oh, just soften, just be a little kinder, that our true nature would unfurl itself. So it's who we already are and there are practices, there's ways we can train our attention with each of these abodes, each of these uh, qualities that cultivate it, that wake up these experiences. So how do we do that? How do we train ourselves in loving? I mean, if we took a poll, how many people would say, nah, I'm not really interested in being a more loving person, <laughs> you know? I mean, really. And most of us, there's some yearning in us that doesn't want to hold back our love, that wants that freedom to be who we are. So how do we train that? And one of the stories I always liked was from Krishnamurti. Um, and he, he advised this. He said, get a rock, place it in your living room somewhere, or something like that. He said, every day, at one point during the day, just go by that rock and just pay attention to it a little. He said, in two months, 
that rock will become a sacred rock. Now, how does that happen? I think something in us intuitively gets, yeah, when we really give our wholehearted attention to anyone, to any part of this natural world, our attention connects us our awareness merges with what we're attending to and we see beyond the veil, we see what it is, we see its beingness, we get its isness, you know. I sometimes think of it that, you know, uh, I watch us with our dogs and I'm thinking of this because we just, uh, my mom and I just adopted a, a, a new dog and we're probably, probably going to get another one and how when you have a dog you, you like dogs in general, but your dog becomes special. You know, it's got that special something. <laughs> and how come? You know, it's... We've paid attention to that, that being, and we sense that soul and sentience in a very immediate, intimate way. But that's possible everywhere. I mean, I think of it as a, a mom with a child, and you know if you're a mom, when you're, especially when your child's an infant, you just, your attention gets absorbed into that being. You, it's, it's oneness. You just sense that beingness is what you are. And um, of course our children feel special. It's because we pay attention to the degree we do. So you might be thinking, well, there's a lot of people I pay attention to and I don't have all sorts of warm, fuzzy feelings, right? I mean, it could be that you say, well, you know, I pay attention every time my partner is, doesn't clean up after himself in the kitchen and, you know, that doesn't do it for me. Or, you know, I pay attention, you know, to my boss when she tells me I've missed something in the latest document I submitted. So it's like, yeah, we fixate our attention, but that's not the kind of full, mindful attention that we're talking about, you know. How we pay attention has to do often with our wants and our fears. We pay attention to each other through a filter of what we're wanting or fearing in relationship to that other person. So that's not this unconditional presence that we're talking about. I'll share with you one of my favorite... This is a New Yorker cartoon from a long, long, long time ago. And it has this family in their sitting room and the guy is, the father or the man is sitting there and he's really, really angry and upset, like he is steaming, he's red, he's brewing on something. And here's what everybody in the room is thinking, okay? The woman's thinking, was it something I said? And the dog is thinking, was it something I buried? <laughs> the cat's thinking, was it something I dragged in? <laughs> and the parrot is thinking, was it something I repeated? <laughs> and what I liked about this is it's just so clear for us that what's going on, this insistent, incessant inner dialogue, when we are paying attention, we're paying attention through this thought process that has to do with me, what I'm afraid of or what I want. So the question is, how do we offer a full attention to each other that's not contracted by judgment, that's not contracted by our guilts or our fears? Because our quality of attention with each other will determine the kind of relationship we have. It's that simple. And so then we ask the question, really, so what blocks us from offering that attention? You know, what blocks us from offering a loving presence? You know, with our, with our children, our partners, our colleagues, or our friends. And if we really watch how we pay attention, we get some absolutely essential information in being able to wake up. Because what we find is that in any moment that we're wanting something different or we're defending in some way uh, or we're preoccupied, our heart is closed. Now I'm using this uh, word heart closed, heart opened, and I wanted to say that sometimes it's taken as this real metaphorical thing, but it's actually very physiological. You know, 
you can think of it that when we're not in reactivity or stress there is an openness that allows a flow of blood and of electrical currents and of more subtle energies sometimes described as qi but there, there's an openness that allows a flow and our heart can be thought of more as a space than a thing there is a space or a region or an openness that allows these energies to move through us and it's actually more energy moving through the heart than there is through any other part of our body in that way so when we're not stressed there's a lot of flow it's a conduit for, for energy and when that happens the, the felt sense is love there's a warmth a kind of brightness an aliveness so that's when that's our capacity that's when we're unstressed and at ease now what happens when we get stressed? I mean, stress closes our heart as often as I can when I'm doing, when I'm presenting to different groups I will remind the group or those that don't know about it of the word busy and the Chinese syllable which is heart killing very close to busy and how when we're stressed the heart tightens and you can sense it that, you know, when we're in fight flight what happens physically? well, the blood flow goes to the arms and the legs so we can run and fight, right? what happens in the brain during fight flight? well, the limbic system's activated and there's less activity in the parts of the brain that have to do with peace and love and happiness, the frontal cortex there's not as much, there's not activation, we're cut off from the parts of our brain really that have, that bring into our life empathy so the heart's rather shut down in a lot of ways and then we say, well how many moments of my day am I feeling stressed? well, if we're honest, a lot there's a lot of moments that, that we're not in that open-hearted tenderness and feeling the flow and, you know, receptive to our world and engaged with others when we're stressed, rather, we get very self-centered because the fight-flight activity means that we're organized around me here, world out there, world is either very, very dangerous or it has something I need and something's missing that's the kind of energetic atmosphere so our actions come out of that some of you might remember the story of um, there's a kind of a helicopter with a rope dangling down there's 11 people hanging on to that rope and somebody needs to drop to just let go and, and die because otherwise the, all, the rope will break so finally, there's one woman, the rest of them are men finally this woman says, I'll do it, I'll do it I'll be the one to sacrifice because women always sacrifice we do it for our children and we do it for our partners and we're the ones that are just giving, giving, giving to make sure everyone else is taken care of at which point all the men started clapping <laughs> so we can see it when we're stressed it gets self-centered we can see it with the really big stressors you know how many of you have been on your way to catch a flight when you got caught in traffic? like, what happens? I mean, we're cut off from our hearts we get really very, very squeezed and we can see it, you know, in a very daily way with the littler things not quite so, so big that we're late to a movie or we don't have a, an ingredient we need for a recipe what happens? We, it's just amazing how quick that openness can kind of close down so a closed heart, there's some perception of threat we don't close our heart because it feels good it doesn't feel good there's usually when our hearts close there's either a sense of agitation and kind of a raw, tight, fisted feeling or else there's numbness doesn't feel good so we don't do it because it feels good, it's a reaction it's a contraction to protect ourselves the sad thing is in that reaction to protect and control it becomes habitual so we can move through a lot of our life many swaths of moment without a real quality of openness and tenderness
A friend uh, volunteered for quite a while at, at hospice and one story she shared was about a woman who had cancer and a very, very short time to live. She had a large tumor on her tongue and she loved to talk and she couldn't talk much. So it was a very um, difficult situation but when this woman would come in, my friend, she really wanted to talk and so they did some and talked a little and then this friend of mine came back about three, four days later and the patient she was visited was sitting on the edge of her bed all dressed up and ready to go home. And so this was what happened. This is her story. A few nights right after uh, the last time they had met, she had the worst nightmare of her life. And in that nightmare she, she woke up, she dreamed that the staff at the hospice center told her that she was about to die. And in her mind she went, no, no God, it's not time, I can't. And she was flooded with this sense of separation. But it wasn't only from God. She also felt separated from her husband. And she said, this flash of realization, she realized that she had been carrying resentment for decades towards her husband. And ever since they had brought, were bringing up their children and her constant mantra was, you know, he's not doing enough, he's not doing enough. She had built up this wall of armoring and resentment and she realized, it's not my time. I have to go and speak to him. I have to let him know I love him. Well, what happened was in the next two days the tumor shrunk and that's why she was now able to have enough time to go home and to speak from her true self. Which is what she did. She, she went home and she spoke her truth, you know, including, you know, the pain of knowing how she had held back love, had armored herself. And there was a tenderness and a healing that occurred and then she returned to the hospice and died soon after. To hold back love is perhaps the deepest suffering. Something in us knows it, something in us knows that it's where the freedom and the beauty and the joy is and to hold it back to have our fortress that we're protecting ourselves with become a prison. And sometimes not to even know it, to have a lot of time pass and not even realize with the people in our lives, our sisters and friends and sons and parents, that we've been only partly there. That brings up a tremendous sense of sorrow when we really face that. So again the inquiry is how when it's become a habit to defend our heart, to blame, to hide, to pretend, to try to get approval, to try to in some way um, maneuver, manipulate others to get our way, how when these are deeply grooved habits do we begin to, to wake up and to let that fortress kind of become a little more porous, a little looser. Let some of that love shine through. And I would say that one of the very first steps is the courage to be willing, without adding on more aversion, to just look in the face of how we are creating separation in our lives right now. You know, if we could just leave tonight with a little more sense of, oh, well, with this person, here's how the habit's playing out. If we're mindful of that, there's a little more space and a little more choice to let go some of our defenses, to be real, to be there. So, so our first reflection tonight, we'll just do a couple, is, is that, just to kind of do a little bit of a scan of our own lives and um, Yes, yeah, so just sit however is comfortable for you to take a look. S- sensing this as a pause 
and inviting yourself to be right here. And what I like with any meditation, any heart meditation, just to touch into your own sincerity that this matters to you, that there is something about loving freely, about not holding back our love, that really is important, that you care about. So if you can sense your own sincerity, that's actually as much of the practice as anything else. And it's from that sincerity that as you reflect, you can not add on a second arrow of judging yourself, just to look with with interest, with curiosity, with friendliness. So the inquiry really is, you know, is there a person in your life right now that you'd like to have a more open, flowing experience of loving with, where you, where you know that there's some blocking? Because it helps to do a reflection when you have an example, somebody in your life. Someone that, someone that you'd like to experience more of an intimate connection with. It could be your child, partner, colleague, boss, employee, grandparent. And then just to begin to sense what within you is in the way. In other words, what are some of the habitual thoughts that, that move through about this person? that might be contracting your heart? What are maybe the judgments you might have about that person or about yourself that are contracting your heart? What might you be believing about this person, about you, about your relationship, it actually is getting in the way. Just to see it helps to give a little bit of mindfulness and space to not believe it so much. What are some of your ways of being distracted or preoccupied that might keep a distance with that person? Or maybe for you, what is it that you're wanting from that person that actually creates separation? Just to be the observer, a friendly observer of what the patterns are? What are the ways of acting, your ways of acting that might create distance? Perhaps criticism, or just being busy, maybe ignoring, maybe being defensive, having to prove you're right, presenting yourself in a certain way. These thoughts and behaviors are all part of a kind of a stress, grasping, aversion. And just by being aware of them you can start to relax that fist in the heart, just open a bit. For now, just to even sense your aspiration, to be a bit more awake and aware when these thoughts and behaviors arise is a real gift, is a real offering and creates the grounds for more intimacy. Just that aspiration. Okay, can I be aware of this? Okay, so we'll continue. You can open your eyes when you'd like. 
Okay, good. So let's look a bit more on how we can cultivate that intimacy and love with others. And, and so I'm, what I'm beginning with is just the quality of attention that we start bringing this mindful awareness. It's kind of an unconditional presence right to the ways that we create separation. And of course the training is, can we, when we're with each other, and, and keep this particular person in mind, because I'm going to bring you back to this person at the end, how can we begin to have more of an unconditional presence when we're with that person? Or a sense of benevolence, a sense of just listening, of having a space for that person. Can we remember that that attention is the purest form of love, just paying attention. Sometimes the, the metaphor is of a disinterested uh, grandmother who just has that space for the grandchildren to play and be however they are, whether they're naughty and wicked or angelic and cute, whatever it is, there's just space. And, and I like the grandparent metaphor because I'm now, most of my generations all like having those experiences of first and second and third grandchildren. Uh, I'm still waiting in the wings on that one, but, <laughs> but everybody is so completely blissed out. They say, it's so much better than being a parent, you know. You know, you completely adore them, but you don't have to deal with the, you know, all the attachments and the reactivity. So there's this thing, and disinterested, by the way, does not mean not interested. Disinterested means you're not hooked in. There's a care, but it's very allowing. So um, somebody sent me these uh, stories about grandparents and grandmothers, and this, this, she writes, My young grandson called the other day to wish me happy birthday. He asked me how old I was, and I told him 62. He was quiet for a moment, and then he asked, Did you start at one? <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to share a few more. After putting her grandchild to bed, a grandmother changed into old slacks and a droopy blouse and proceeded to wash her hair. As she heard the children getting more and more rambunctious, her patience grew thin. At last she threw a towel around her head and stormed into the room, putting them back to bed with stern warnings. As she left the room, she heard the three-year-old say with a trembling voice, Who was that? <laughs> Another. I didn't know if my granddaughter had learned her colors yet, so I decided to test her. I'd point out something and ask what color it was. She would tell me, and always she was correct, but it was fun for me, so I continued. At last she headed for the door, saying sagely, Grandma, I think you should try to figure out some of these things yourself. <laughs> Last one. When my grandson asked me how old I was, I teasingly replied, I'm not sure. Look in your underwear, Grandma, he advised. Mine says I'm four to six. So I like that grandmother metaphor. So we just just interested and yet loving and attentive. 